Good afternoon and welcome everybody. This is Lucy Savitz at Intermountain Healthcare and I'm really pleased um, to be able to say that we are launching our last and final series of training webinars for this year and they all focus on healthcare acquired infections. Um, as you've seen in the previous emails that have come out announcing this particular webinar, it's very clear that human factors plays a key part. And our subject matter expert in human factors, Dr. Frank Drews, who's a, an internationally renowned expert in this particular area, has agreed to come in and talk with you specifically today about human factors and the key issues, um, challenges, and opportunities for improvement in these areas that apply across all the healthcare acquired conditions. Um, I, I want to be sure that you are aware that on November 1st or number, November 5th at 1 p.m. is the first webinar in that series on surgical site infections. You can visit our website and see the calendar for the upcoming events. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Frank Drews. Frank, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about the work we are doing and the background. Um, and what I try to do today in this presentation is um, really um, demonstrate a little bit how human factors um, work can actually make an impact looking at hospital-acquired infections. And I will focus on some of the kind of um, approaches we've taken and report some of the results, and then hopefully we'll have later on quite a bit of time for discussion. So uh, let me start actually with um, giving you just a quick overview of what human factors is in case you haven't heard of it. And uh, you can see there's a um, definition of the area and what human factors really includes is looking at uh, human psychological, social, physical and biological characteristics and trying to apply actually um, the resu results from research on those issues to optimization of a human performance in complex systems. And the way I try usually to think about it is what we have is we have a human operator and um, this person uh, is interacting with either hardware only or hardware and software and all of this interaction is happening in a particular environment and each of those individual components contributes to uh, overall performance in the system. Now, when we look at human factors, um, one of the things we're usually interested in is actually, and this is often a starting point for human factors-based analysis, is to look at uh, breakdowns of human performance. And hospital-acquired infections, of course, being preventable, uh, is exactly one of those uh, breakdowns. And so, when we think about breakdowns, you can ask what are the contributors? And we can actually distinguish two different types of reasons why we encounter breakdowns in human performance. One is people make errors. They cause errors, they make mistakes. And uh, there are different types of errors uh, that are usually um, distinguished in the literature. And we can talk about slips. These are basically um, errors people commit when they execute something, some activity. They reach out for the wrong uh, item, for example. It's basically execution-related. Lapses are kind of um, error where people are um, not remembering some information. So we have a checklist, and they actually don't use the checklist. They rely on memory, and they forget a particular step in the sequence of action. And that leads to a lapse of memory and, as a consequence, an omission of a step in the procedure. And then finally, we can look at mistakes. And those are um, is a category of um, human error that is related to situations where people develop a wrong idea, a wrong understanding, and then uh, utilize a particular plan, a particular intervention that results in some kind of breakdown, some kind of problem. Overall, when we look at human error um, and um, error, in spe error specifically, um, then we basically can say that uh, what contributes to error is what we refer to as cognitive underspecification. So uh, somehow, the person who is performing in this context does not have all the necessary information available. So there are missing elements, and often what happens is they are filling in elements that are 
default. So they are making assumptions. Unfortunately, sometimes, and that's of course resulting in performance breakdowns, they make incorrect assumptions based on prior experience, based on base rates, for example, and that overall then results in error. Another cause or um, yeah, cause of uh, human performance breakdowns are violations. So here we actually have a situation that people um, have some kind of plan of action, and usually it is a procedure, for example, or some kind of protocol, and they commit a violation. They deviate intentionally uh, from this particular protocol. And so we can distinguish among others, most importantly for our purpose here, we can distinguish between routine violations. So people are routinely deviating from a procedure. They know they should do it in a particular way, but because they experience that actually there are some benefits of um, doing it in a particular way, skipping, for example, hand hygiene at a certain point during the procedure, they actually can be faster. And consequentially, they are continuing to actually commit this particular violation. And then we have corporate violations. Those are violations that are more located at the higher levels. And they basically are outlining, they're affecting the conditions under which people are performing. The interesting thing about violations is really that they are a result of cognitive overspecification. So here, actually, there's too much information available. There's too much detail available, and it is difficult for people to follow all of these individual steps required in a protocol, for example, and consequently, they actually feel they can invent better ways. They can do it better based on their experience, and then they deviate from the protocol committing a violation, and that may result in a performance breakdown. So the goals, of course, then, for us as human factors experts are to improve performance and to minimize, as a result, error and violation. So some people, Ernst Mark, for example, they talk about two sides of a coin. We are on one side have successful performance. On the opposite side, we have error and violations. So if we look at uh, performance breakdowns, we can distinguish two factors that result uh, in performance breakdowns, and some of them are intrinsic. So we can look at um, factors that are inside of the person, and those can be, for example, sleep deprivation. We all know that when we're sleep deprived, maybe worked for 20 hours, 16 hours, um, we will not perform as well, and that may lead to error and violations. In addition, we know that other factors like aging, for example, affect performance. Uh, we know that uh, the older we get, the more likely it is that we may commit mistakes, for example. Um, though, on the other hand, the tendency to violate procedures may actually go down. Now, we can also look at extrinsic factors. So these are what I earlier referred to when you go back to this Venn diagram as environmental factors. And here, what is resulting in breakdowns in performance are, for example, interruptions. If you are interrupted frequently, if you are interrupted at a particular part of an action, you may not actually resume your previous action. You may forget, forget to presume, and as a consequence, you may not successfully um, execute this particular program. Time pressure is another factor that leads to higher rates of error and, of course, higher rates of violations. I can do it faster. If I just skip this one time, nothing is going to happen, hand hygiene, uh, then uh, I will finish it in time and can go to my next patient and nothing is going to happen. Never. Things never happened really when I skipped hand hygiene. And uh, equipment is another extrinsic factor. So providing suboptimal equipment to people who are uh, performing certain tasks may result in error, may result in violations. And the important thing now for us, and this is a good starting point for human factors analysis, is we have to ask ourselves, which of these factors can we control? What can we actually make an impact? So how likely is it that we can tell people and they will actually then also follow this kind of recommendation to sleep eight hours a night? How likely is it that we can actually reduce overall interruptions. And there have been very successful interventions, for example, in the context of medication dispensing. 
uh, where people were successfully reducing interruptions and as a consequence reducing medication administration error. And we can, of course, also look at uh, time pressure. We can reduce time pressure by increasing staffing levels, for example, or we can improve equipment. So these are really important considerations when we begin. What can we control? Where do we actually have a way of changing things? And when I think about problems of human performance, I usually try to think about a model. Um, I try to think what do we know about performance and how is it usually affected by factors. And so I have a really kind of, this you can see is a standard model. It's kind of a flow chart if you want. The end point in all of this are adverse events. So we experience patient injury, for example. Now, if we go back, what we usually try to do is we try to implement defenses. And uh, those defenses, unfortunately, often have some holds, but sometimes they hold. And as a consequence, if there is a hazard, uh, the hazard may not actually reach our patient. And consequently, we actually are successful defending our patient from, let's say, hospital-acquired inf infection. Now, we can look at active failures. And now you can see we have our categories um, that we talked about earlier showing up. So active failures can be error, so slips, lapses, and mistakes and violations can be part of active failures. Now the question is really, how do we actually influence the likelihood of active failures? Now we can move back. We can distinguish between error-producing conditions and violation-producing conditions. So if we have, for example, um, certain tasks, uh, we can create them in such a way that it makes it more likely that people will make mistakes. Uh, if we have, for example, devices that are very badly designed, we have infusion pumps, for example, where the user interface has many flaws, it's too complex, has a menu structure that goes several levels into depth. Uh, this is very likely to create a situation where a nurse programming this pump may commit a slip and consequently create a hazard that may or may not turn into an adverse event. On the other hand, if we look at violations, we also can say there are certain factors that make it more likely that people will actually commit violations. And one of them is, for example, peer behavior. If we have a standard in our unit to, for example, um, being pretty laissez-faire about hand hygiene, then that will increase the likelihood that people will actually violate uh, procedures. And then all of this is driven by latent conditions. So here we actually have organizational processes and management decisions that make all of these conditions, error-producing conditions and violation-producing conditions, more likely. So this is kind of the background of the work. So this is how we think about processes, how we think about human performance in complex systems. Now, what we were trying to do in our work was really create a um, framework that actually helps people perform better and reduces the likelihood of error and violation. And so we developed an approach, and we call it adherence engineering, an approach that really tries to help people perform better. And there are a couple of principles that are part of this idea. One of them is um, when we use tools, when we create tools or design tools, one of the ideas here is to create affordances, making it easy for people actually to perform actions. Affordances are properties of objects that invite people to do an action in a particular way. So an example for an affordance would be a coffee cup. And if you think about how you hold a coffee cup, you often hold it by the handle on the side. So the handle creates an affordance, and it's a pretty strong affordance, though, as you can see, when you look at how you hold a coffee cup, for example, you may actually violate this affordance and hold it differently. Um, another principle to improve performance is to provide guidance, but now what we really are interested in providing task intrinsic guidance. So ideally, when you have someone perform a task, a complex task, whatever equipment they're using is helping them to stay on track, is sequentially, for example, ordered. 
we also want to implement nudging. So what we mean by that is really helping people to um, make choices that are optimal. So in terms of selection of certain types of equipment, we don't advocate giving people 10, 15 options. Actually, what we know from the literature on decision making is that people get confused and often they have, have a hard time making choices. So by minimizing the overall number of choices and standardizing equipment, what we do is we nudge people into using certain types of equipment. Also, selection and implementation of defaults that are smart, so defaults that are commonly used is an important principle. We have two more principles that are relevant. One is providing feedback. Whenever possible, people need to know how they perform. And this can be on a unit level where you publicize monthly infection rates. It can be on an individual level. It's really critical that you provide feedback to people. And of course, this is a big challenge that they performed hand hygiene correctly. Without this feedback, we don't know if we succeeded in performing this procedure or not. And then two other principles are important. One of is uh, reducing cognitive effort people are spending when they are performing tasks. You want to minimize cognitive effort because people often are uh, interrupted, for example. People are distracted. And um, so you don't design for optimal conditions. You design for worst conditions, and relying on maximum cognitive effort being spent during um, performance of a procedure means you're setting up people for failure. And we want to reduce physical effort. People try to minimize physical effort as much as possible, and if we design equipment that does that, people are more likely actually to follow uh, the kind of pathway we want them to follow. So being adherent to, for example, a particular procedure. So now let's talk about one project we did. We actually looked at central line associate bloodstream infections and we tried to minimize those infections. Um, of course, you are all familiar with the facts about central line associate bloodstream infections. We look into an excessive length of stay of about seven days after an infection. Um, we have a mortality rate ranging between four and 20%, cost are 35 thousand to fifty six thousand and they actually make up one third of all preventable death in healthcare. And of course we also know about the um, kind of proposed approaches. We know that one of the solutions um, provided for example by uh, Pronovost was is to use checklist protocols. Now when we look at checklists and of course there's a long, long history of use of checklists. So here, for example, on the right side, you see a little figure that is actually a um, checklist for um, a Boeing 747. Um, and that's only a part of the checklist there. And um, when we look at checklists, there are certain um, problems with checklists. And I think these are really important when we are applying solutions that have been successfully used in some domains, and we are applying those solutions to uh, our domain, healthcare. So one of them, for example, is that usually having a checklist in front of you requires you to multitask. You now perform the task and you actually read the checklist. Or you have to have additional staff to supervise you while you're performing the task, telling you, okay, you check this, check the next step, and so on. Introducing a checklist means that you increase overall cognitive task load. So now, in addition to monitoring the task, you now monitor how you're performing the task via a checklist. It leads to a checklist fatigue. If you have had many, many, many checklists that you perform, and pilots report this actually frequently, you actually get really sick of checklists. You don't want to use them very much. Another really interesting, psychologically interesting phenomenon is that um, checklists lead often to um, expectation-driven perception. So what this means is really if you use a checklist and you've used it many, many times and you always saw that the status was green and now the status of your instruments is red, you may perceive green because you go with a high default with a base rate. Uh, so what we think is checklists are a good solution for highly structured tasks in contexts where there's very little variability. 
And aviation is exactly one of those contexts. Healthcare, in some contexts, might do this, and there I am with uh, Atuga Wandi. So the OR surgery might actually have this, these properties. I think uh, other areas in healthcare, intensive care units, for example, may have this, these properties to a lesser extent, and therefore it might be more difficult to use them. Okay, so what are challenges in CLAPSI prevention was our first question. And we did actually summer structured expert interviews. We asked nurses and physicians, and the idea was really that we try to identify the optimal approach to reduce CLAPSI. Uh, we wanted to identify current barriers and potential facilitators uh, that could actually help us accomplish the goal. Now, we talked about specifically insertions, and we talked about um, central dressing maintenance tasks. And in the context of insertions, what people were pointing out was often it is a lack of training, little experience, or too little training of the provider. Um, Often what happens is, and you all know this, um, this is part of how we sometimes still approach training, uh, see one, do one, teach one. And um, there was also mentioning of equipment being not quite optimal, not supporting the task, um, because lots of choices have to be made uh, during the insertion and so on. Um, now, the insertion is an interesting situation because this is a task that is performed by a physician and usually by someone who's assisting. And so here, we have a situation where a checklist can be actually been, can be used because someone else is potentially monitoring progress. Now, if we look at the maintenance task, central dressing maintenance task, here problems we identified were, again, lack of training or insufficient training but also there were not clearly defined standards and variability in performance of individual nurses was rather high. They actually were doing you know, what they thought would be the right approach, but there not, were not necessarily clearly policies in place. And also here what we identified was uh, that the equipment that was being used was suboptimal. And uh, this can mean, for example, in some contexts, nurses have to go out and collect all of the equipment in the supplies room. And this can be 25, 30, 35 items individually, or people were using jumble packs, so kind of little Ziploc bags that contain a lot of the equipment, but still not all of the equipment. So we decided to focus in our work on central line maintenance. Um, you all know there's a lot of work that has been done with regard to insertion, very successful work, and so we thought, Maintenance is probably one of the contributors um, that is causing some of the um, collapses or increased collapse rates. And so here we focused on two issues. We focused on equipment and variability in performance. And so our questions were really, how can we reduce variability, increase adherence to standards that we identify as optimal best practice, and how can we optimize the equipment? So. Um, when we look at non-adherence and complex tasks, uh, one of the things that we observe very frequently, um, and we can look at the literature on maintenance activities, and again, aviation is a very, very rich literature on these issues, is people omit steps. So you have a large number of steps, and this can be hundreds in aviation. Um, it can be in the mid-20s in terms of activities required or steps required for central line maintenance, uh, people forget to do individual steps, and that can increase the risk of acquiring uh, central line associated bloodstream infection. Also, there's a variation in sequence. People may approach the task using one sequence one day and another sequence another day, and so there might be an optimal way of doing it. And so they deviate basically from optimal sequences, from best practices. We performed a conceptual analysis where we looked at the task of central line maintenance, and here we found out that it requires more than 25 steps of a nurse. And think about it, you have to now know that you have to perform all of these 25 steps when you do the task. So some of them are you know, internally driven, so you know if you do one step, the next step follows, but sometimes there are breaks in sequence, and you need to now think about what is next. So, what it really means is if we assume, we can mathematically just 
analyze this, we have, if we assume a really low error rate, an error rate of one error out of 100 steps, what it means is that if we do a 25-step task, the overall likelihood of successfully executing this task is 0.77, which translates into one error in four procedures. That's pretty high if you think about it. It is not really reliable human behavior if every four times we make some mistake. And it can be a minor mistake, but it can also be a major mistake, contributing significantly to risk of infection. So this is an image that shows you the status quo. So we did an empirical assessment. What are nurses doing right now? And what we found was really it, the equipment that is being used doesn't support nurses or and uh, what it really provided us with was a great opportunity to resign, redesign the test and the equipment based on human factors principles, based on these principles I outlined earlier, like uh, those that are associated with this approach of adherence engineering. So um, we basically tried to develop optimized equipment, and as a consequence, we tried to integrate also into this equipment the checklist. So we wanted to increase adherence to best practices. We wanted to provide guidance. But now we wanted to, to take a different approach. We didn't want to have an external checklist. We wanted to implement the guidance in the equipment. And so these are the kind of principles uh, that are um, making up affordance engineering. And um, we, for example, want to create affordances to make uh, use of equipment more intuitive, and we implemented it in the kit we designed by having tabs, very clearly visible tabs, very clearly visible flaps for pockets, and so on. So you can actually look at these individual uh, goals we try to accomplish using the individual principles and how we implemented them in the type of equipment um, that we developed. Um, so this is what we came up with. Uh, so at the Salt Lake VA, uh, we basically uh, developed a maintenance kit. And um, you can see in the upper right image, this is kind of how the kit looks like when you take it off the shelf. It has all the components that are required to perform the task. Um, on the upper left corner, you can see actually a maintenance guide. So this is actually the first piece of paper a nurse takes out of the kit. So it's if you look at the lower left corner, so this is kind of the preparatory phase. Um, and you see there's the guide tucked in. And you open the pocket, and you start taking out the guide. And it has actually even a little sticky on the back, and you can stick it somewhere if you want to be reminded what to do. Um, you can see that the tasks, um, so the individual overarching tasks are actually grouped. So we have a preparation phase, we have a sterile field phase, and we have a um, needleless injection site care phase. And you can see we use color to code these individual phases. So orange is preparation, blue for sterile is sterile phase, and then green is for the NIS care phase. And you can see on the labels in the lower part of this picture how the phases are outlined, again, in colors. We use the icons to illustrate what are the tasks. And we try to design icons that are very, very salient. So people look at them once, and they realize, OK, this is hand hygiene. This is masking, and so on. So what we did was we then actually um, started collecting data, and we used a very simple design. We had a pre-intervention, post-intervention design. Um, you can see the number of observations we performed during the pre-intervention phase were 107, post-intervention 109. And what we did was we didn't rely on self-report data. We didn't ask nurses, how did you do? Did you do hand hygiene and so on? We felt that uh, self-report is commonly biased data. It is overestimating uh, real occurrence of you know, adhering to procedures. And as a consequence, we decided to observe nurses. So we actually had a trained ICU nurse observing nurses participating in the study. And we had a very, very detailed um, tablet PC implemented um, task documentation 
that basically required our observer to check off individual elements of the task. And so what we decided when we started analyzing our data was we actually looked at best practices and those were hand sanitization, chlorhexidine scrub duration, antimicrobial bandage application, and catheter hub disinfection being performed correctly. And so we had um, three months of pre-intervention observation, and then we actually still are continuing to collect data post-intervention. And here I give you the data. It's preliminary data. Uh, the effects actually became robuster and robuster. The more observation we added, we have 109 post-intervention observations. And if you look at it, the odds ratio actually of performing hand sanitization increased significantly. Now, as a result of our post, during our post uh, intervention, we basically have the odds of hand sanitization correctly performed being 8.06. The HG scrub duration, we time it. We run a clock. We really make sure that it's according to the specifications. Uh, again, the odds ratio is significantly higher. Um, catheter habit disinfection, the last category, similar large effect. And I mean, these are significant effects in terms of the odds ratios of improving performance. Antimicrobial bandage application was not significant, and this is because the pre-intervention adherence was in the lower 90% range. So we basically were um, trying to fix something that was already performed at a very high level of adherence. Nurses really performed this task well, and so it is not a big surprise that we weren't able to improve performance there. So the whole idea of a diminishing return comes up in this context. So we can try to increase performance, but we have to satisfy ourselves with a performance that is probably in the mid-90s in terms of adherence. So we can look at the number of omitted items. And again, pre-intervention, what we have is people collecting individual items on the supply shelf. Post-intervention, they grab the kit. And then what they need to do is they need to actually um, grab an additional element, which is if they um, are using um, catheters that are having more than two ports, they actually have to grab an additional side care kit because we designed for two ports that were the most commonly, dual lumen catheters that were the most commonly used ones at our site. And you can see that in terms of the number of omitted items, uh, zero items um, being the first category, there were significantly more uh, omitted items in the post pre-intervention phase than in the post-intervention phase. And you see a similar effect for the, now spec talking about the number of items, so when we look at one, two, and three items, significant reduction in item omissions. And again, the one can be only explained by the fact that sometimes triple lumen catheters were used and nurses did not take into account this fact and didn't take an additional side care kit. However, the benefit here is that if you are interrupted or if you realize at the end of the procedure that you didn't bring an additional Sidecare kit, you can actually, because you've completed the task, walk out and take it off the shelf and walk back into the room and perform this task. Where if you have another more essential item missing that is important for the sterile field phase, you will have to break down the sterile field. So it's less of an issue, really, if this item is forgotten than one that is much, much more critical during sterile field phase. Uh, similar Observations looking at errors, so you can see, again, significant effect. Uh, the overall number of errors um, was um, much, much higher pre-intervention and was reduced post-intervention, so um, kind of other documentation of the successful implication of this uh, kit. And um, so overall, what we found was a clear improvement in terms of adherence to best practices after implementation of the kit. There were fewer item emissions and fewer errors observed. Also, what we found, of course, this is of more clinical relevance, is uh, a reduction in central line associated bloodstream infections. So during our pre-intervention phase uh, that, was, that lasted three months, uh, we had two confirmed um, clapses and one that was, un that was ambiguous. Um, 
we weren't able to really determine if it was a CLAPSI traditionally defined or not, and so it's difficult to count it. Post-intervention, actually, what we have is zero central line associated bloodstream infections for over 18 months now. And again, you know, clearly, um, maintenance is not the only contributor to central line associated bloodstream infections, but I think that insertion has been performed very well at our site, and so looking and focusing specifically on maintenance I think helped us to reduce the pretty high CLAPSI rate. Okay, so we are now at the next phase. Um, we basically are in the process of redesigning the kit, the first version of the kit. Um, so we had nurses use it. We learned a lot. We had a lot of feedback. And among those um, things that nurses uh, provided us feedback with as criticisms was that the overall footprint of the kit was too large. It took too much space. And so as a consequence, we actually changed the footprint. We made it smaller. Um, we also actually moved away from a kit that uh, used a folding pocket approach, and now we're using roll-out pockets. You can see that in the, one of the next slides, but we also actually decided that um, we um, needed to switch, actually, the uh, needle injection site. Um, and what we observed, actually, previous in our previous phase, where the NIS care was at the end of the procedure, nurses still sometimes omitted this procedure. And this is very typical for post-completion error. So you accomplish the task of doing the dressing change, and the NIS care is not quite associated with this task conceptually for a nurse, and consequently they actually may omit the step. And so we now changed the order and actually switched the NIS care at, to the beginning of the overall procedure and then have nurse perform the sterile field uh, part of the um, procedure. And again, we also were able to lower the costs of the kit, um, and we reduced the drape size as well. So now nurse, initially nurses were really unhappy about the large drape we were using. Now it's a smaller drape. It's handy. It fits very nicely over uh, the side, bedside table, and nurses really like it the way it is right now. So this is uh, what I mentioned earlier. There are a couple of pictures of this newly designed rollout kit. Again, we use the same principles of adherence engineering. It's just um, a slightly different approach. Same labels. It's very clearly labeled. There are fold-out uh, flaps and all of that. Here you can see the sterile uh, portion of the dressing kit. Again, very clearly labeled. Arrows indicating where you open the pockets. And this is actually um, the sterile portion. And here you can see, probably hard to really see it, but in the upper left corner you can see how the gloves actually are kind of in the outer part of the package. So when you open it, the first thing is you pick the gloves and then actually you are using the gloves to unroll the overall kit, which means you are not in um, kind of a situation where you may threaten sterility of your surface. And then you have the individual pockets and in the lower image you can see how the labels are coming up now and it's all of these individual pockets are labeled. and in terms of the contents and the step of the procedure you have to perform. Okay, so this is one of the two interventions we did uh, using adherence engineering. The other intervention we were kind of conducting was related to ventilator associated pneumonia. And here again, just to give you the facts, we know that it happens in 8 to 28 percent of all mechanically ventilated patients. Mortality rate is really high, 24 to 50 percent. There are reports, actually, some studies report uh, mortalities in the lower 70 percent. Length of stay is approximately 4.3 days longer for patients acquiring VIP, and it really emphasizes the importance of prevention and, of course, the rapid identification of infected patients to um, administer uh, antimicrobial treatment. Um, now, we, again, took a similar approach we took uh, to the CLAPSI. So we 
We're interested in what are the problems of EAP prevention, and as a method, we use semi-structured expert interviews. We talk to nurses, physicians, and respiratory therapists, and our goals were very similar. What are the best approaches to reduce EAP? What are the barriers, and what are the facilitators? And when we looked at our results, what we found was one of the biggest problems people pointed out was really consistent performance of oral hygiene. So what we found was decent but relatively low adherence to a scheduled oral hygiene, and oral hygiene is essential to prevent VAP. And uh, one of the reasons why uh, oral hygiene wasn't performed consistently was that getting the information that it was time to perform oral hygiene was associated with high information access cost. What this means is a nurse who wanted to find out if it was time to perform oral hygiene needed to go into the um, patient record system, needed to look at notes, needed to make sure that it was now when the time the previous oral hygiene was performed, needed to calculate how much time had passed, two hours is the schedule, and then needed to perform or delay the performance of the oral hygiene. So this is really high information access cost, and what we know is that even minimal information access cost, like pushing, pressing just a single button. We did a study where we looked at information display, patient, patient displays, where pushing a single button to get, for example, history trends of patients may mean that nurses are not using this type of information. And so um, that was one of the issues. And then another issue was that sometimes supplies were not provided. So occasionally there were breakdowns and restocking responsibilities. And so we decided that this needed to be clearly defined and associated with individual responsibility. So our intervention then was basically, uh, since we identified that um, information access costs were so high, we tried to minimize those access costs in addition to allocation of responsibility to stocking. So here, respiratory st therapists requ were required to perform restocking at standard times in the morning, and we made sure that this happened very, very regularly, that there were no um, days when it didn't happen or when there were delays. And to minimize information access costs, we basically tried to um, identify the information that was required to perform oral hygiene in a timely fashion. And so the idea was to provide the time of the application rather than having nurses calculate uh, when they needed to apply oral hygiene. And we wanted to provide a very salient cue that actually um, nurses needed to perform oral hygiene with minimal information access cost, IAC. And so overall, we looked at the number of kits that were used during a 24-hour period of time. We didn't look at VAP rates because they actually were very, very low. We had zeros. And so as a consequence, we were really looking more at building up defenses, additional defenses. Remember back earlier my slide about this conceptual framework? So here what we try to do is make defenses more effective by making sure that oral hygiene is performed adherent to uh, the requirements, the recommendations. And so what we did was a very simple approach. We basically placed labels about the time of when to perform oral hygiene on the supply packages. And those supply packages are placed in the patient room next to the door. So when the nurse comes into the room, one look, one glimpse, is needed to identify what time the next oral hygiene needs to be performed, here 14 hours. And so the nurse basically could look at it, no information access cost, could perform oral hygiene, and uh, this is what we did as an intervention. So we started this intervention uh, in uh, April 2011, and these are the data. And we actually were very fortunate because we were able to use historic data because the unit actually collected the data on adherence before we did our study. And you can see that actually pre-labeling um, the adherence average was about 75%. After our um, kind of intervention, we increased uh, adherence to oral hygiene to 90%. So this is a pretty significant increase in terms of adherence. So 
Overall, we were able, with a very simple intervention, to increase adherence. And one of the um, estimates was that one one VAP, one prevented VAP, would actually pay for 100 years of label use. Uh, so you can see, in terms of return of investment, this is a very, very low-cost intervention. But it was possible only by doing a very careful human factors analysis. Um, so we were able to sustain uh, higher levels of adherence. You saw in the slide that actually it lasted many, many months after implementation. Um, and again, because of these ideas about diminishing returns, it is very difficult to push adherence even higher. So, you know, additional efforts would be required to do so. But again, this was a very minimal effort intervention. Okay, so what can we say about human factors in hospital-acquired infections? Very quickly, uh, so on a theoretical level, human factors can provide us with a framework that helps us really to not only analyze, but also to reduce error and violations in healthcare. And adherence engineering can be such a tool. Uh, it also increases our understanding of differences and similarities between healthcare and other more traditional human factors domains, for example, aviation, for example, nuclear power plant control. So we have to really be very careful. We have to ask ourselves, do all the lessons learned in aviation apply really to healthcare? And I think in some contents, contexts they may apply very well, in others they might apply less. On a practical level, human factors can actually help us with design considerations. I mentioned it earlier, we need to design for the worst case. We don't need to design, or we should not design for the best case. For example, nurses will be distracted. And designing a user interface that requires full attention means we're setting up people for error, for failure. Uh, we need to expect error, and we need to evaluate new equipment in the context of its use. We need to provide guidance. We cannot just rely on internal control, which means expertise, training. We need to help people to adhere by providing them with more forcing functions, by creating more affordances, by providing them with smart defaults. We need to help them to um, simplify procedures by structuring choices. We all talk about standardization. I think this is exactly what we need to do. We need to help people to use equipment that is identified as optimal. At a systems level, we need to create more error-tolerant systems. Error needs to be more forgiving. So again, this means we need to implement more defenses. In terms of implementation considerations, it's very important to collect data, data about breakdowns, data about successes. Uh, we need to provide feedback. Again, it's essential that people know where they are so that they can compare themselves with the unit standard and can compare themselves with other units. Social comparison is critical to motivate people. Data need to become relevant for learning and for implementation of change. If we look at training, one of the things that is important is we need to help people to understand their limitations. We need to help people to understand that being interrupted, being forced into multitasking is a problem, and it will lead to decrement in performance, threatening patients, safety. We need to create shared cognition, more team-based approach. We need to help people to see what they are doing to other members of the healthcare team and how it affects their performance. And we need to provide external guidance whenever possible to minimize training requirements. One of the problems we found was people do not have the time to take training. Uh, there are too many trainings. And as a consequence, we need to rely more on external facilitators, external control rather than internal control. And this is pretty much um, what I wanted to give you as an overview on how human factors can help. And uh, now I think we can open the forum for questions. Great. Thank you very much, Frank. That was excellent. Um, do we have any questions? Are there any questions that come in yet? Let, let me ask there. one while we're sort of going through the motions. And again, you can type your questions in. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, 
So you talk about design for adherence, which is really fascinating. Do you have specialized staff who help you with that, or do you outsource it? Is there a vendor? No, actually, what we did was with this particular kit, we completely used just human factors principles and applied them, and we did it in-house. So wow. this was really, for us, it was proof of concept work because we started with this idea that we needed to reduce error and violations by creating more support. Mm -hmm. And so that generated then this idea of adherence engineering, which is really our brainchild, if right. you want. And as a consequence, then we said, okay, how can we implement this in a kit? And so we developed a kit in, with great support by the staff at the um, hospital and um, helping with great help of graphic designers and other people. So there were a number of people involved in all of this. So it's got really quite a bit of support. But again, it's a proof of concept. It's mm -hmm. the idea that by developing smarter equipment, mm -hmm. especially equipment that uses already pre-manufacturers pieces, right. we can actually guide performance, help performance to improve. That's great. Thank you. Jason, do you have any questions? It doesn't look like there's any questions, so if you do have questions, type them in the Q&A box. Um, oh, we just got one in. So um, this is from Kathleen Colby. What kind of strategies were employed to minimize interruptions while in process? Thank you, Kathleen. This is a very, very good question. Actually, we were um, not trying to minimize interruptions during our observations. What we tried to do was really observe the impact of interruptions. And I didn't talk about those data. We have those data and we know that interruptions actually create patient hazards. Um, what we try to do when we designed this kit, based on our experience with a large-scale interruption study we performed a couple of years earlier, uh, we tried to implement clearly visible feedback. So we tried to, by using these different pockets, to provide guidance by letting people know where they stopped the task when they got interrupted and allowing them to resume based on you know the visual feedback. Okay, this is the pocket where I stopped. This next one is still sealed, so this is where I continue working. So that was an attempt. We didn't really try to minimize overall interruptions in this particular study, but I think it's a very, very important um, work that will need to be done to find better, more effective strategies to reduce bad side interruptions. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I guess I, I can uh, um, read. I'll read it. Okay. okay. So from Joe Dalto, we've got a question. Explain the cost versus benefit of Clapsy solutions in a similar fashion as you did with the VAP solution. Oh. Yeah, here the costs, of course, of the intervention were much, much higher. They were significantly higher. Um, I think um, if I – I don't remember, actually, our exact numbers, unfortunately, but I think the cost of the kit uh, were um, slightly higher than the cost of the individual components. I think we're talking about $5 higher. So with, I think if I'm not – misremembering this, and now we are really, you know, talking about a lapse of memory on my part. I apologize. Um, if I'm not misremembering, uh, we talk uh, of overall cost of uh, components at $19, and the revised kit, I think, costs about $25. So it's a very minimum, minimal increase. And if you think about the cost of a central line associated bloodstream infection ranging between 35 and 50 thousand dollars, you can buy a lot of kits for a price difference of five dollars. So, and you know, I think you have a significant impact overall in performance, as our data suggests. And we are still in the process of collecting more data. We haven't seen a single central line associated bloodstream infection. We actually have right now an additional site where we are collecting more data. So we are expanding our intervention basically, and hopefully after data collection, the results will speak to themselves and support our current um, kind of findings. Great. Thank you, Frank. I, we're waiting on some other questions, so you can still type those in, but let me read a comment that I got from Bruce Bailey at Providence Health System. And the point that Bruce wanted to make here was the um, importance of some of the points that um, Frank has just made. 
and, and in that the fact that almost all of our new safety measures like checklists and redundancies really increase cost overall and are a form of waste in healthcare technically, and that's based on some of the work that Bruce and I did that was funded by ARC. Um, with, and he says, with good human factors principles, we simplify and make things more efficient, not to mention things are easier and we don't fall back on the same old people really ought to want to do this. Um, we need you know, more training kind of um, perspective, which is the point that you made. And so um, I think that these are really important points that cut across all of the areas that we're working in, actually. Thank you. Yeah, I think, again, I really like this idea to not work harder, but to work smarter. And I think health, human factors actually can help us to work smarter rather than work with more effort. Other questions? It doesn't look like we have any other questions in the Q&A box, but um, if questions come up while you discuss it with your staff um, or in your hospitals, feel free to email us at admin at henlearner.org, and um, we'll get those to Dr. Drews to answer those questions. Yeah, I'm very happy to do so. Great. Thank you. And um, we'll have these questions that came up and the recording of this webinar posted on our website, the www.henlearner.org, so you can view and share that with people that weren't able to attend. Great. And um, we thank you for joining us today. We hope that you found this as valuable as we have. Um, good luck in your work, and please be sure to tune in for the November 5th session uh, with Dr. Connie Price on surgical site infection prevention. Thank